what type of medical student were you? Were you top of your class? No, no, absolutely nowhere near. Um, and in fact, after my first year, I failed the first year. Involved in there was a theatre society that I got very very interested in. Um, I didn't act. I was a stage manager, but I loved it. I didn't do enough work and failed the first year completely. Resat it in the summer um, and failed again. Uh, and then uh, in those days you could appeal, and I appealed and got back in again. Repeated the first year, and after that I did okay. I didn't fail anything else. Pop was not bother with orthopedics, <laughs> um, but I never did particularly well. I was certainly never top of the class. When you're a medical student, what were the pressing issues then at the time? Do you remember any specific moments? Or when I was um, a medical student, it was would you get a job or not? Um, so right. now there aren't enough doctors in, and, and we, you know, and it's, it's relatively easy to get a job. But when I was training, it, boom, it tends to be boom and bust in medical economy. Um, and when I was training, there were too many doctors. So everything was really a competitive and you have to take that into consideration when choosing a specialty and, and choosing where you were going to work. So that was a big issue for us as medical students. Would we get a job and would it be in our first choice of specialty? Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so it's almost kind of... Completely reversed yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. But that, that was a big thing and it was difficult if you were a woman um, because in those days there were no interdenary transfers or anything like that. Mm. So um, one of the reasons, and I chose psychiatry because I loved it, but one of the other reasons why I chose it was because it was one of the specialties where you probably could choose where you worked. Right. Um, my, so my husband was doing surgery and he had absolutely no choice um, geographically. So yeah. hard to get a job, he just had to go wherever he was given one. That's interesting. Do you think it's it's any easier for women now? Much easier for women now. They were still worried that children that um, female doctors would want to have children and would take maternity leave. And uh, I was actually the first person in my hospital, first consultant to have maternity leave. Wow! So it was very very Gosh. different um, then. <laughs> as it should be, yeah. as it should be. And there were definitely places that didn't want to appoint women because they would they might take maternity leave. I will take their job seriously. It was a big prejudice against women, which now has just gone. Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, do you want to maybe talk a little bit more about why you think there's so much stigma in the NHS and generally against psychiatry? Against psychiatry. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a shame. Um, stigma's still alive and well. So when I went into psychiatry, um, my, my boss said, "You don't have to do that. You're you're a, you're a good doctor. You're an intelligent person. You could do something else." and people are still having the same experiences today. I still meet foundation doctors and medical students who, who um, get the same experience. So I think it, it, it's, it's based on, on, on ignorance and on us not understanding what causes psychiatric illnesses. So there used to be a massive stigma against TB and then once people knew what was causing TB, that stigma lifted, which is why I'm so keen on the, the neuroscience. Sure. But why do you think the stigma has even come about? What was the... Yeah, so what do you think started it all? I suppose because, um, because psychiatric illnesses affect the way that people behave, um, and there's still a, a big school of thought that um, that you can just do something about them. So there are still plenty of people who think that if you're depressed, you can just pull yourself together. Um, there's not always an understanding that it's that it's an illness, and you can't just change how you feel. So I think that's probably where stigma comes from. So uh, hopefully, we'll be the generation to uh, yeah, I think it change will. So did you take up leadership roles in the medical school? I, was, um, I, think, I think I was social secretary of the um, Student Medical Society. I used to arrange trips and, um, and events, but I don't think anyone would have particularly seen me as a leader. And what do you think now? What are your thoughts on being a leader? Um, it kind of happened to me almost um, by mistake. <laughs> the best way for it yeah. to I really, I really didn't um, didn't plan to be a leader. If I was giving people advice about leadership, I would say treat people as you would wish to be treated. Be kind to people, um, treat them well, lead from the front. So don't expect people to do things that that you wouldn't do. 
Um, and I guess one of the great advantages of, of leadership roles is that you can um, bend things your way a bit, not totally. Um, even as president of this college, there's lots of things that I can't just change, but you've got more chance of influencing things from, from the top. And how do you think that you managed things like failure and kind of hard problems along the way? Uh, don't be frightened of failure. Mm. Actually, if you look at successful people, a lot of them have had really terrible fails earlier on. And I think once you've done it, once you've hit rock bottom, um, then the only way is up. And you're not so frightened of failure in the future. So actually, I think it's it's you know, advise people to go to medical school and get thrown out. But yeah. I think it is, it's useful to have at least one failure so that you can deal with it. Mm. If you could pick one person, who is your inspiration? My mother. So my mother became a doctor at times when women didn't really do it. She went to the Royal Free Medical School because they, they, they took women. She was the first person in her family to go to university. So it was um, it was an amazing thing that she did. Um, and as well as being a, a doctor, she was also a really good mother um, and fantastic baker and cook. And so she was a real inspiration. And she taught me that women could have it all um, at a time when they didn't usually. Did you know that you always wanted to pursue a career in medicine? Yes, both my parents were doctors. So I decided when I was about two that I wanted to be a doctor. I always knew that I wanted to do that. I've always <coughs> felt that um, health is actually the most important thing in life. And if you can bring people back to health, that's the best thing that you can do for them. Did your peers describe you um, when you were as a medical student, were you the party animal, the hard worker? So when I was a medical student, I was yeah. definitely the party animal, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful time. I went to loads of parties and just really, really enjoyed myself. Because I worked very hard at school. Yeah. Um, and at school, really, my hobby was the St John's Ambulance Brigade. I used to go out with them every weekend, so I didn't really do much kind of socialising. So I had that year where I socialised, so yes, they were described as a, as a party animal. Um, that's completely changed now. <laughs> now I'm a very hard worker. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so how suicide rates within the medical students group is said to be higher than other students. Um, why do you think that, and what can be done? I think that's probably that? always been true. So when yeah. I was um, when I was at medical school, I had a friend who um, who, who attempted suicide. Luckily, he wasn't successful. Um, well, the, the pressures of medicine are um, very great, and when you're learning to be a doctor, you have to learn to distance yourself. You're seeing people who are distressed, who are having the most terrible time, who are dying. You see awful, awful things. And you have to learn to distance yourself from that so that you can function, but at the same time you've got to keep empathy and you've got to keep compassion. So I think that's that's really hard for, for people. Why do you think that mental health is such a taboo subject with medical students and in medical because schools? Because of the because of the stigma. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're worried about what would happen. So I think medical students fear that if they say they suffer from mental illness that, that people may um, feel that they're stigmatised because of that. Do you think things like fitness to practice might also come into play as I've read that some students might think that's a yes. reason for concern? Yes, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think that, that does worry people because um, the GMC, and, and rightly so, has to keep an eye on people and make sure they are fit to practice, but then, yeah, that, that makes people worried about it. Yeah. So what do you think mental health will look like in the future? I think it's going to change a lot in the in the years to come. So when people people like you um, are hopefully seeing a career in psychiatry, I think it's going to look different. Neuroscience is advancing really rapidly now, and during your lifetime, we're going to get a lot of answers to what are the physical determinants of some at least some of the psychiatric illnesses that we deal with. So that will change things. We'll get better treatments. It'll make psychiatry slightly less, slightly less fun. At the moment, it's purely a clinical specialty, so everything is done um, on the history and the clinical examination. But I think we will we will get tests. Things will change and get better treatments but psychiatrists will still need to understand about the social and the psychological so even when we understand what's going on in your brain um, often the best way to get at it is going to be through talking so I think we'll find that traumatic experiences do something to the physical chemical structure of the brain but then the best way to unpick that is probably going to be through psychotherapy so I don't think it's going to mean that we're not we're not going to become neurologists well, psychiatrists will still be needed Cool. Do you think there's anything that you spoke that you know when you were younger you like to party now you have, you have to work very hard? How do you maintain that kind of work-life balance in a role like 
one that you have now. Um, with, with my family, because um, I spend time with my husband. I've got two children who are grown up, but still sort of see them a lot. And my cats, I've got two cats. <laughs> <laughs> names for them. Yes. Yeah. You've got names for them? <laughs> For the, for the cat, for the cat, yeah, Simba and Twinkle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they really, really miss me. Oh, <laughs> and they try and follow me to the station now. If I leave with a suitcase, they try and follow me. <laughs> I have to shut them in the house. <laughs> Just touching on the resilience and bringing mental health issues as well. What advice do you have on dealing with difficult situations? Family is really important. Mm. So I've been very lucky with my family. That really helps things and things outside the home life, outside work is really important and then the other thing I must have had some natural resilience because I got through those times all right but the other thing that really helped me was my psychotherapy training so um, part of the psychotherapy training that you get in, in psychiatry is about um, how you react to things how you react to patients how they make you feel and that teaches you a lot about yourself um, and about situations and I think that really does give you some robustness for coping with the things that you have to Technology seems to be advancing medicine yes. in, in other areas. How do you see that in science? I think it's been a slightly mixed blessing. It's lovely to have your BNF on your iPhone. Um, so when I started, there was no BNF. We actually had to learn, as medical students, we had to learn the doses of wow. every, every type of medication. Um, and I remember when the first BNF came out, it was such a wonderful thing. And that's, that's on your phone. I never could have imagined that. Mm. So I think the NHS is not that smart about how we use technology yet. We need to get better at it. Yeah. Last but not least, a uh, fun fact of the day. If you could invite three people to dinner, who would they be? Um, they would be the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge <laughs> and Prince Harry because I'm really pleased about what they're saying about mental health and how they want to, to get involved and I'd like to have a bit more time with them discussing it. Thank you very much, Wendy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.